Oh, um, whoops. That's not what we're going to talk about. I'm interested more in why the sky sometimes erupts in pure bright light, sometimes even in the middle of the night, while it's stormy. Yes, lightning, but not the action of like the lightning bolt, but why the heck, now this is the, the picture that I've always been given, there's a planet here, I don't know, it's kind of brown, blue and stuff. And uh, maybe it's got green stuff on it too. I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> this is you. You are here. And then there's this cloud, right? And the cloud, okay, this is not to scale, but the point is the cloud becomes very negative on the bottom and very positive on the top. And what's always bothered me is I didn't know the mechanism by which that happened. So I've done a ton of research and I'm going to try to parse that out for you or maybe just for me for posterity so that I... Personally, personal posterity, my future, I want to um, be able to remember what I right now think I understand. So, uh, and, and correct me if you're a meteorologist um, and uh, you're my nephew, then I'd love to know what I'm doing wrong here. So, you know, of course, uh, the whole process that I do understand is this electric field here is now affecting the ground and this dipole cloud is causing the electrons to run down into the center of the earth. There they go. Wow. Or just a little bit deeper into the crust than they were originally causing a positive, now immediate surface. Um, and then uh, when the electric field in between these electrons here, these abundant electrons and those um, that dearth of uh, dearth on the earth of electrons right there, uh, and the electric field gets big enough, then uh, ultimately the atoms in the air become ionized and you can get a little zap, right? So we're gonna try to study though, I, I wanna discuss right now this part. Why is the cloud separating the dang charges. And this must be an incredibly strong process because these charges up here, all these positives, see them, they hate each other and they would want to separate. And uh, also these negatives hate each other. And also these positives like these negatives. So there's like, there's a pump. If you can imagine something must be pumping all the positive charges up here and keeping them apart. Much like inside of your favorite dry cell, you know that there are fairies in here who carry the electrons over to this side, right? And anytime you take one away, they're going to carry another one, but they go from this side where uh, they're taking the electrons away. So it's becoming positive and carrying them out. So, so the, the fairies pump batteries that makes plenty of sense but inside the cloud what's pumping right and so that's the question that you might ask your friends when you're about to go out on a friday night but in this case we have a very specific cloud pumping question what is pumping here and why don't they recombine so what i, I believe there must be a steady pumping process right here. I was reading a little bit of Feynman because um, he's probably the greatest physics teacher the world's ever known. Uh, oh, there's that other great guy, Walter Lewin, right? But Feynman says some things. Feynman says that in the atmosphere as a whole, between the surface of the Earth, which is kind of negative, and the um, upper ionosphere out here, it's an ionosphere because it's getting constantly produced ions because of the radiation that's bombarding it. Pew, pew, fast things go in here, and they create little ions. So maybe there are pluses and minuses blobbing all around up here and, you know, reacting crazy. But here's my point. Here's my point. Um, the Earth is extremely negative as a whole compared to the ionosphere. And that voltage difference, I'm going to get out a very big voltmeter and connect it to the ground and the ionosphere, which could essentially be considered ground, which is kind of ironic because <laughs> the Earth is actually the ground. But let's, uh, let's be serious here. The Earth is at a potential of negative 400,000 volts. Whoops, that's a zero. 400,000 volts compared to the ionosphere. So that's a big deal. And also um, there's a continuous discharging of the Earth because there are always some ions floating around in the air. You know, it's, it's mildly conductive because of the free ions that float. Maybe they attract other stuff with them and they're these globular ions. You know, some move up, some move down. Probably the negative ones move up because they hate and the positive ones move down because they see some negatives hanging out over there. So the Earth's continuously discharging and this process right here of the dumping of negative charges onto Earth through the clouds is charging up the Earth. So this pump that's pumping the clouds is actually pumping the entire Earth negative continuously. Maybe not continuously, maybe staccato, maybe it's actually from the lightning bolt and it is. So that's really neat. But the Earth is negative because of normal cloud lightning. There's another call of light, kind of lightning called positive lightning, but I don't want to talk about that. 
So here's what we know. Feynman gives us some things that we're going to have to make our model fit, some experimental evidence. You can measure the dipole electric field of this cloud. If you go a long way away from it, like build a tower over here, and then lean out with your electric field meter electric fieldometer, and um, you, it's probably in a box, right? And so what you do is you have it record the electric field as a function of time, and when there's a lightning bolt, when there's a lightning bolt, we're going to lose the charge that's in the cloud. And uh, this and, and another calculation of current can enable you to find that what what are we what are we things we have to work with? What if we make a graph of the electric field? This is the dipole field of the cloud as a function of time. Now, what you find here is the cloud's pretty steady, and then bam, there's a uh, a lightning bolt, and then the cloud is neutral E neutral esque, right? And then it rebuilds, but this rebuilding process is an exponential decay up to the value of, um, you know, what it was. And, and so this, uh, you might call this time right here, the reset time. It's building itself back up and being ready again to, um, to have another lightning strike, right? And so uh, what do you think that is? How long do you think it takes for a cloud to rebuild its, um, <laughs> its ability to have a lightning strike, to build up the charge again, the charge separation. I think that's an important number because it tells us just how powerful this pump is. And what, uh, what we find is that it's about five seconds. Whoa. So you can get lightning and then, uh, you know, the geometry is changing all the time, right? So you're not going to get exactly the same condition every five seconds. It's not going to discharge. But in principle, you could have... Um, lightning every five seconds, and it would be a fresh bolt of lightning that's been freshly generated from the energy of those separated charges caused by this mechanism that we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Now, what else is interesting is that the charge in the cloud, let's say the charge at the bottom of the cloud that's going to be dumped down, is about negative, ooh, excuse me, 20 coulombs. Wow. Now I'm talking about the charges in the cloud, not the electric field, but uh, you can imagine there's some negative Q over here and there's some positive Q over here because of that pumping mechanism. So we have a pumping mechanism that has to be able to supply, what do we have here? Um, charge and time and current. So current is charge divided by time. So uh, I'm looking at a current of, wow, four amps. Four amps. This is happening throughout the entire um, uh, cross-sectional area of the cloud, right? It's, it's happening through this whole gritty area, right? So eh, maybe that's not a, a large current per square meter, but this is a pretty enormous current as a whole that needs to be pumping positive charges up and uh, negative charges down. So it's a current upward. So what's causing it? I mean, Okay, I mean, I guess we're ready to start talking about that, but my point is, these are the things that you can't argue with. These are experimentally verified things. Now, you can argue with anything that I say afterwards. Uh, for instance, um, the claim that, here's the claim, from what I can gather, the current state of research uh, has this fact. Um, this proposal, let's say, inside of a cloud. Now, here we are entirely inside of the cloud. There are lots of things going on. Now, isn't that interesting, right? But the general idea is that there are things that are frozen up at the top, and there are things that are melty down at the bottom, right? And that's kind of reasonable, too. Um, not so much that they're falling when they're melty, but like it's colder higher up in the atmosphere. So just geographically speaking, there's a much greater abundance of frozen things up here and melty things down there. Now, you know clouds happen when there's an updraft. So we know that there's an updraft. And that updraft is causing some stuff to go up. Now, who's going to be more affected by updrafts? Let's talk about the three main constituents of these clouds. We've got ourselves droplets of liquid water I get uh, teased a lot for how I, I pronounce uh, liquid, uh, liquid, I guess some people say liquid, liquid, I don't know. You tell me how you say this word, because I was raised to call it liquid. Um, anyway, there are droplets of liquid water, but they're not supposed to be liquid because it's way below their freezing point, but they remain liquid because they don't have a nucleation, and, and nucleation is actually something I want to do 
a, another video on you raise your hand if you want to see a video on what nucleation wit is. Uh, hint, it will have champagne in the video, so you should not watch it if you are less than 21 years old in the United States. I guess if you're European, you can watch whatever you want. But, these super cool, they're so cool, super cool. Okay, let's be honest, they're super cool liquid droplets are hanging out in the cloud, and that's one type of thing that is in the cloud, not Google Cloud, but actual cloud, and what else is in the cloud? Oh, there are uh, little bits of um, snow, like tiny little cutest unique in all the world snowflakes. I guess they're less likely to be unique if they're really small. But there are bits of snow that's in the cloud. Uh huh, uh huh. And then there are these things. I love this. I'd never heard of this word. I'm going to try to pronounce it, and I've never heard anyone say it before. This is what happens when you do your research on the internet. I think it's called grapple. Grapple is a kind of a gooey hail. <laughs> uh, okay, so grapple is also floating around in the cloud. But, um,. Golly, this formatting is awful. Gropple, snow, and liquid supercooled droplets of water are hanging out here. But I want you to think about, really I'm just going to talk about snow and gropple because I don't know how the liquid water plays into here, but maybe I'm not sure if anyone knows at this point. But, but snow versus gropple, the snow is probably bigger and the gropple is probably more massive. So now I want you to imagine going outside and dropping something small and massive and something big and fluffy looking with hexagonal symmetry, I'm sure, right? Um, uh, uh, which one falls faster? If it's like, it, pretend we're just outside the cloud, these things are just gonna fall. And you know that even if the gropple has less mass, let's make it have even less mass. Even less mass. Now it has less mass than the snow. Wow, look at that really small grapple. Um, it's not so much the masses that matter. It's really a question of um, how. How's the best way to present this? You've got a ratio, right? And so the ratio is kind of like mass over surface area, because surface area is going to affect the drag, right? So this is kind of like weight, which would be the downward force, divided by the upward force, which is going to be drag. Anyway, um, on both counts often, and, and sometimes just on one count, the surface area issue, the snow is going to be able to um, really be much more affected by any updrafts. Anything running into it, uh, any uh, fluid motion is going to bump this guy around. And the grapple's just gonna keep on falling, and it's it's growing when it's up here. So what's what I think is really cool is that you end up having this frozen grapple that tends to fall, right? And uh, <laughs> the snow, which tends to not fall as rapidly, and they're colliding into each other, and there's some kind of electronic interaction from those collisions. And you can look up all kinds of things, like there's electrical interactions in sandstorms. Now sandstorms are uncharged insulators bumping into each other. There's no reason that there should be any electrical interactions, but there are. Maybe it's piezoelectric or something because they, they're crushed a little bit when they collide. I don't know, but some other people know and you can look at that later. Right now, you need to finish this video and that involves this snowflake and this droplet right here. Now the funny thing is, this droplet likes electrons. And this snowflake right here doesn't like electrons. Uh, uh, yeah, doesn't like, um, electron. Okay, so, uh, that is the only hole in this theory. And I have a paper pulled up by S. Data. No, really. At all, uh, let's see, we've also got, uh, Goswami. And this is a 1996 paper from, um, two universities in India. Yay, go India. Now, these guys have a paper, uh, published called Charge Transfer 
process during ice ice collision within a uh, thundercloud and so it was published in the indian journal of radio and space physics you could read it if you want but it's several pages and it's kind of thick um that might be the explanation for why these guys like electrons and these guys don't like electrons when they happen to run into each other these guys gain electrons and remember they're falling through the updraft or at least remaining where they are and the snow having its huge surface area is forced upward in the updraft and carries its now positive charge because it's losing its electrons every time it collides with one of these suckers right here. Not all its electrons, don't be silly. Some. One. Maybe. Now, that snow goes up and it carries its positive charge up and the grapple goes down and it carries its negative charge down. So you end up with, as a consequence of all of that, doesn't like them and likes them, you've got the surface of the earth and you've got a beautiful cloud and you've got negatives here and positives here. That was what we were seeking to do, but think about how many collisions there must be between these two forms that uh, the newly solidifying um, water can take. It's reasonable then that all of these collisions continuously happening because of the continuous updraft um, would be able to pump uh, the positive charges separate from the negative charges, thereby storing energy in an electric field here, which can dump these charges down to earth and continuously charge the earth, Not Sorry, not, <laughs> I made that mistake again. Wow. But staccato charged the Earth negative so that we get the electric field that we witness pointing into Earth. Um, that's it. If I, I don't know. Are there other details you want to know about? I don't know them. Good luck.